Hare Krishna. So today I'll be continuing our discussion on Krishna's moods. Can I decrease the volume a little bit? Krishna's moods in the Bhagavad Gita. And yesterday we discussed about how the we discussed Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Good. So, yesterday we discussed about how the Bhagavad Gita is not just a book of philosophy. It's a conversation between two people who have a very affectionate, loving relationship between them. And while Krishna's central message seems to be philosophy, but it is philosophy in the service of love. It is. He is expressing his love and as an expression of his love, he is giving philosophical wisdom to Arjuna. And I discussed from the first chapter onwards how the emotions come out, how Krishna's entry is there and how when Arjuna is bewildered, how Krishna responds to that. Now Krishna takes him forward step by step by step. So especially we discussed how Krishna is so eager that we devote ourselves to him for any reason it may be that he says Udara, he is so large hearted. If somebody worships him for any reason. And then I concluded yesterday by talking about how in the ninth chapter Krishna he is not a demanding God, he is a descending God. He descends to lift us up from where we are. And no matter how many bad things we might do, Krishna doesn't stop loving us. We don't have the power to do anything so bad that Krishna that it will make Krishna stop loving us. And if we just maintain a devotional intention, we, he will redeem us, he will elevate us. So the ninth chapter ends with one of the famous verses. It's like saying, Manmana Bhava Madhbhakta, just fix your mind on me. And that's how the Raja Vidya, the most confidential knowledge, ends. So then we have the tenth chapter, which is known as Vibhuti Yoga, the yoga of the greatness of the Lord. So here Again, Krishna speaks spontaneously. I discussed yesterday about how there are different questions which Arjuna asks and Krishna answers. But sometimes when Krishna is in ecstasy, delighted to speak a particular point, he just goes on. So the 10th chapter is like that. And in the 10th chapter, he begins by telling, Param bhuya pravakshami jnananam jnanam uttamam bhuya eva mahabaho shrunume paramam vachaha so, I am speaking this most confidential knowledge to you because you are very dear to me. These are my supreme instructions. Because I consider you very dear to me. For your benefit I am speaking this. So sometimes if there is an examiner, if there is a teacher who is also the examiner, who is also the exam paper setter and the teacher wants the students to do well in the exam. So then the teacher may tell you, this is an extremely important point. The idea is the students will understand, okay, this is very important, let me note this down carefully. Now. So similarly, Krishna is telling this, oh, I'm, this is most important, I am speaking for your benefit. And what does Krishna speak thereafter? Krishna speaks about how everything comes from him. And then he speaks over there that if you understand my opulence in this way, then what will happen? So vikalpena yogena yujyate natra samshayaha. If you understand this, you will be able to fix your mind on me. So avikalpena yogena, your mind will not get distracted here and there. So the idea is, in the 10th chapter, Krishna speaks his glories a lot. In fact, later on, when Arjuna asks, please speak your glories. At that time, Krishna will say, 
that esh tuddesh tah prokta i'll speak as a example as a sample actually non tosti vis romaya that actually my glories have no end so somebody might say hey this is really arrogance <laughs> like somebody if you ask somebody can you please introduce yourself actually my introduction is endless <laughs> <laughs> but i'll speak for a few i will just speak briefly <laughs> you may say whether the introduction is endless or not your ego is surely endless <laughs> but when krishna speaks this way what is going on and krishna is saying that actually nothing can exist without me atadasti vina yatsya maya bhutam chara charam nothing can exist without me yacha api sarva bhutanam bijam tadaham arjuna that i am the seed of everything that exists so krishna is basically saying that everything that is attractive in the world it all comes from me yad yad vibhuti mat satvam shri madurjitam eva va तत्तवागछत्म मम तेजोंश संभव इन टेन पॉइंट फोर्टी वन इज सेज दैट एवरीथिंग दैट इज अट्रैक्टिव एवरीवेयर इट इज अ स्पार्क ऑफ माय स्प्लेंडर सो दिस एट वन लेवल कैन सी वेरी इगोटिस्टिक टू थिंक दैट आई एम सो ग्रेट बट वी सी कृष्णा इन दिस टेन पॉइंट सेवन इज टेलिंग इफ यू अंडरस्टैंड माय ग्लोरी इज व्हाट विल हैपन यू विल बी एबल टू फिक्स योर माइंड ऑन मी सो कृष्णा हैज अ पर्पज फॉर स्पीकिंग इट So if Krishna were simply like a very egotistic person, he would first of all not be as a charioteer of Arjun. He is serving Arjun. So Krishna's mood is not of dominating and uh, demanding respect. But what does Krishna want? Krishna wants that we connect with him lovingly. Krishna had earlier told how by the path of gradual detachment from matter, we can become liberated. we can become elevated but that's the first six chapters 7.1 he has said actually there's another way and that is instead of trying to become detached from matter try to become attached to me so now to become attached to someone to fix the mind on someone we need to know something about the glories of that person and krishna is speaking his glory so that we can fix his mind on fix our mind on him and when he is doing this his mood is essentially to persuade us to take the medicine the medicine is devotional service is bhakti yoga is remembrance of the object of devotion and it's like suppose suppose there's uh, a person has gone to many doctors and finally they come to one doctor and then the doctor gives a prescription and then this doctor says this patient says but actually i went to that doctor and the doctor was saying like this and that doctor was saying like that and that doctor was saying like that now now if this doctor is the person who has trained all the other doctors in the city and then the doctor says actually they are all my students so whatever knowledge they have that all comes from me now it might seem like bragging but it is not bragging the purpose is compassion the purpose is to persuade the patient to take the medicine and when that compassionate purpose is there then even if one is glorifying oneself what is the intent is important so krishna's intent in a sense uh, acharya has described that the whole of bhagavad gita it seems to be like a glorification of krishna but actually it is a glorification of bhakti bhakti devi bhakti is so great that even krishna is conquered by bhakti and krishna is speaking about his glories so that he can convince us about the glory of bhakti uh, oh how great krishna is if you understand then we'll understand oh such a great person can be attained by bhakti and bhakti must also be great so now and bhakti is ultimately shrimati radharani so from the gaudiya vaishnava perspective actually the whole bhagavad gita is a glorification of shrimati radharani although there is no direct reference to radharani 
There are only two places in the Bhagavad Gita where indirectly. One is Daivim Prakriti Mahashitaha in 9.14. Krishna says, uh, uh, Chatatam Kirta Yanto, 9.13, Mahatmanas Tumam Partha, Daivim Prakriti Mahashitaha, that Daivi Prakriti, it is, this is divine nature. And some other commentators explain that in 2.72 there is the word Brahma, Eshate Brahmi Stiti Partha, Nainam Prapya Vimohiyati. So normally Brahman is masculine. There are genders for words. So Brahman is masculine. But this is the word place where Krishna uses the word the Brahmi. Now Brahmi is feminine. So this refers, some commentators say, to Radharani. This is, this is the hidden, hidden references. But the important thing is the whole of Bhagavad Gita is a glorification of Krishna for the perfect purpose of glorification of Bhakti, which is Radharani. So in that sense, Krishna is not glorifying himself. Krishna is glorifying, glorifying his, glorifying the process of bhakti. So the idea is that bhakti might seem like a very simple thing. Oh, you come to the temple, bow down, pick up some beads and do some chanting. And people may think this is just ordinary. Many times <clears throat> when devotees have kirtans, say in their neighborhood, uh, some neighbors come in their home, they call people from the neighborhood. Not many come. Some people come, some don't come. So, I was in one place in America and the devotees, they were telling me that we said that there is going to be a, we decided to have a Sakirtan, but we called it a Yajna program. And in the Yajna program, everybody can come and do Ahuti. And he said, all my neighbors, it was like a broad Indian locality, my neighbors would never come, they all came. They all came just to do some, uh, put some Ahuti, some sacrifice into the fire. But actually they didn't know, by coming they were hearing the holy name and they were sacrificing their consciousness. So the devotees are also very intelligent. They said, okay, while you are doing this Ahuti, chant Hare Krishna. So they were offering their consciousness. The point I am making here is, that often Bhakti is not considered that special. Oh, Yajna, that's something special. Somebody is doing Tapasya, oh, that's special. So Bhakti might seem very simple. So what Krishna is doing is, when he is glorifying himself, he is saying that everything opulent, everything powerful comes from me. Among mountains, I am the Himalayas. Among rivers, I am the Ganga. Among water bodies, I am the ocean. So through it all, he is actually speaking about the great things in the world, which are great in the estimate of people of the world. And if, oh, this is so great, and they are all coming from Krishna, and Krishna is attained by Bhakti. How great a Bhakti must be. Therefore, Krishna is glorifying himself to glorify Bhakti. It is like say, somebody is a very well-known person in society, they are a celebrity. And then they have a spiritual master. Now if, most people may not know their spiritual master, but people may know this person as a celebrity. And then if the celebrity speaks about where all they have spoken, what all they have done, and they speak their own glory, but then after they enter, and I take guidance, inspiration and wisdom from this person who is my Guru. What happens? Because people will not consider the Guru to be a great person. So we have to convey greatness in, in people's terms of greatness. The point is not just to get it right. The point is to get it across. To get it across. Speak it in a way that can be understood. So Krishna is speaking his own glories to glorify Bhakti. And now this 10th chapter is very interesting uh, that at one place Krishna says Pandavana Maham Dhananjaya He says among the Pandavas I am Arjun. Now when Krishna is speaking this Arjun thinks that actually he will say Pandavana Maham Yudhishthira because Yudhishthira is the most virtuous but he says Dhananjaya he says Arjun. Now, there are external reasons and internal reasons for this. The external reason is that actually Pandu initially thought I will not be able to have any sons. But then he was able to get sons because Kunti had a blessing that she could get sons from the gods. So then he said, actually for a, for a ruler, Dharma is most important. So please get a child from Dharma who will be very Dharmic. And he gets a child from her. 
then it feel that actually dharma is good but dharma alone is not enough you need shakti you need strength so we need a child who is very strong and then whom do they get bhima and then he starts thinking that actually dharma and shakti both are good but more than that what you need is bhakti bhakti and kala samarthya skill so i want a child who will be greatly devoted and who is greatly skilled and that was arjun so arjun was a great devotee and also arjun is greatly skilled he is a champion archer so bhima is also great uh, mace fighter but his 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 strength was his strength his strong point was his physical strength in terms of skill even duryodhan was somewhat better than him but so when he gets this arjun so he feels very content this is a son who can truly uh, protect the kingdom and there is another reason when krishna left rindavan this is explained by gopal champu in jivgos uh, by in gopal champu by jivgos swami that when krishna left rindavan where he had stayed in his childhood from there he was always remembering rindavan and he was always delighted whenever anybody would remind him of rindavan so now among the gopas there is one gopa whose name is arjun so therefore arjun's name would remind krishna of rindavan and that's why krishna naturally connected wonderfully with arjun so now when he says pandava nama ham dhananjaya now what is arjun's response over there oh krishna if we two are one then let's close the bhagavad gita <laughs> why do you need to instruct me it's not like that why not because in what sense is talking about oneness it's not in a absence of absolute oneness is the whole point is vibhuti vibhuti means the the idea is that the one above the many comes as the one among the many the one above the many that means god exists above all of existence the one above the many he comes as the one among the many so in one sense arjun is just another warrior another pandava another warrior or the himalayas is one of the mountains the ganga is one of the rivers but this is extraordinarily special so the one above the many manifests as one among the many that means this one among the many is special so in every skill or in every area there are some manifestations that are excellent and we are attracted to them krishna has earlier said that actually all things come from me although all things come from krishna it's not that we are attracted to all things so now we could say the whole temple is meant for glorification of krishna so every part of the temple is special but when we come to the temple we may notice the deities we may notice the pictures we may notice the chandeliers we may notice certain specific things in the temple so there are certain things which attract our attention so when krishna specially says first he says everything comes from me but then he says that everything that is attractive comes from me so the point is krishna is not making this a philosophical philosophical statement he is making a personal statement to assist us okay we want to become attracted to him then see the attractiveness of everything attractive as coming from krishna that's why he gives all these special manifestations now of course is an important thing there can be different kinds of vibhutis so everything attractive comes from krishna but everything attractive doesn't take us to krishna <laughs> isn't it so now there are so many attractive things in the world but some attractive things we may look at them and we forget krishna so now there is a there is a western author who has written who made a quote and then a book was written on that to- on that topic he says the taste of wine is the proof that god loves us <laughs> so he says wine is so delicious how could something delicious come by chance that god must exist and god must love us <laughs> now prabhupad says actually that is somebody is addicted to drinking and they cannot give up drinking then 
He says, if a drunkard while drinking thinks that the taste of wine is Krishna, then by that they will become a devotee one day. <laughs> Prabhupada is not saying by drinking wine they will become a devotee. <laughs> Whatever we are attracted to, if we remember the attractiveness of this is coming from Krishna, then we can become attracted to Krishna through that. So that list is, is actually expandable. Whatever list Krishna has given of his opulences, we could expand that list in various ways. So, if people are attracted to a particular sport, say people are attracted to cricket. So, in today's world, you can say, among sports, I am cricket. <laughs> <laughs> so, the idea is, if you are so captivated by cricket, what is it that is captivating us? It is ultimately an opulence of Krishna that is being manifested over there. So, uh, this, is a this, is a, this is not an exhaustive list, it is an indicative list. So, whatever it is we are attracted to, if we think about it, what, what, is, what about this attracts me actually? So, it is, whatever is our deepest experience, it is our experience of Krishna. Whatever is our deepest experience, it is our experience of Krishna. So, if somebody is a musician and they get lost in composing music, then they will spend hours and hours composing music. What, what is it? That, what, what is the taste they are getting over there? There is a British author, William Wordsworth. He writes, wrote a letter to his friend. He said, I spend my morning very productively today. Working on one of my new poems. He says, after breakfast, I added a comma in the poem. Before lunch, I deleted the comma. <laughs> <laughs> now, what, what, what productive? But he was absorbed there. Oh, maybe singing it repeatedly, singing it this way, in that way, in that meter, how does it fit? So we say, one comma, how can you spend so many hours? But actually, whatever is anyone's deepest experience, that is their experience of Krishna. It is just that they don't know they are experiencing Krishna. So, if they can understand that, okay, whatever is attracting me, that is actually a manifestation of God coming through that. So, we can be attracted to that, but we need to connect that attraction to Krishna. So, so the whole Bhagavad Gita describes a very inclusive way, especially in this 10th chapter. Fixing the mind on Krishna is not just a matter of coming to the temple and uh, chanting the holy names or taking darshan. Yes, that's very much required. But Arjuna's question was, Keshu Keshu cha bhaveshu chintyo si bhagavan maya How can I fix the, my mind on you? my mind on you? in this material world while interacting with material things so if we can have this vision that whatever captivates us we can become conscious of Krishna in even the things that make us unconscious of Krishna when something captivates us so much that we no longer remember Krishna but if you just understand actually this is Krishna captivating me this is Krishna manifesting like this so, of course, the point is that Krishna is, as I said, the one above the many. And the one among the many can be in Sattva Guna, in Rajoguna, in Tamaguna. Hmm. So now, if you are attracted to tamasic manifestations, then that may little degrade us. But if you are attracted to Rajoguna, if you are attracted to Sattva Guna, that will be more elevated. So somebody likes music. Now somebody can have a very sensual kind of music and that will take their consciousness down. But if they like music, and then they connect with Krishna through, they hear Krishna music. And what is happening? They are attracted to music, but they connect. So one way is to become directly attracted to Krishna by practicing bhakti. The other is to connect what we are attracted to, to Krishna. So when we do this way, we can see bhakti can permeate our entire life. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that we have to just reject our worldly attractions and connect with Krishna. But we connect our worldly attractions to Krishna. So this is the 10th chapter. Now of course, before, before this Vibhuti Yoga comes up, uh, there Krishna says, there is the Chatur Shloki Bhagavad Gita, 10.8 to 11, which I actually just, and Krishna says, if you understand this, you will fix your mind on me. So, when you, Chatur Shloki Bhagavad Gita, basically there are simply four themes over there. First is God's position. Second is the devotee's disposition. The third is God's grace 
and the fourth is the liberation by the Lord's grace. So first Krishna says, actually everything comes from me. And if you understand this, Aham Sarvasya Prabhavo Matta Sarvam Pravartate Iti Matva Bhajante Maam Buddha Bhavasa Manvitaha If you understand that Krishna is the source of everything, what will happen? We will become devoted to Him. We will naturally become devoted to Him. If you understand God truly, we will naturally become attracted to Him. That is the first point. Understand God's position. Then those who are devoted, what do they do? Krishna says, Machitta Madgata Prana Bodhayanta Parasparam and those who are devoted to Krishna just delight in talking about Krishna. Ramanticha. Raman is often used with sensual pleasures. But that is the greatest pleasure in the world. Krishna is saying that in discussing about him, there is a greater pleasure than that. Ramanticha. So if you want to know who is devoted to Krishna, we can look at what does this person, what does that person delight in? If that person delights in speaking about Krishna and discussing about Krishna, hearing about Krishna. That means, yes, this person is devoted to Krishna. And then, if we devote our life to Krishna, then what happens? And Krishna says that, Tesham satata yuktanam bhajatam preeti purvakam dadami buddhi yogam tam yenamam upayantite. Krishna says that, I will do magic in your heart. That whatever guidance you need, I will give that guidance. Now, in one sense, Krishna is everyone's guide. But Krishna is not a guide who forces himself on others. So if we become receptive to him, then Krishna gives his guidance. And then Krishna, the last verse says, Vanu Kampartha Ahamagyana Jamtamaha Nashayam Yatma Bhavastho Jnana he says, even if somebody is not very intellectual, doesn't matter. I will give them the intelligence. Even if somebody is very, has a very contaminated heart, a very dark heart. But Krishna says, I will illumine their heart. I will light the torch of knowledge in their hearts. So Krishna says, if you become devoted to me, I will personally enlighten you. It is not that you have to strive separately for enlightenment. Just try to devote yourself to me and I will enlighten you. So, if you see these four verses, Krishna's two verses fully are about what Krishna will do for us. If we just devote ourselves to him. And this is the 10th chapter and it, when it concludes, it's actually Krishna is overflowing with ecstasy about Bhakti. Because he's talking about himself so that he can talk about bhakti. So that he can glorify bhakti. And here, the first verse when Krishna says that if you understand my position, then you will become devoted to me. So the point over there is that actually Krishna is saying that we may have this competitive vision. That okay, let's say if there's a tennis tournament, when somebody is say rank 100, somebody is rank 50, somebody is rank 25, somebody is rank 1. So we say, this person is rank 1. So like that we may see there are any number of beings and God is number 1 being. So we may have this idea, God is the best of all beings. That is true, but that is not the complete truth. God is not just the best of all beings. He is the basis of all being. It's not there is a hierarchy in which you can climb up and you can come to God. Now whoever is wherever in that hierarchy, Everybody is getting that power from Krishna. God is the basis of all being. Even whatever power we have, it is coming from Him. So that's why when we understand this, then there's, there's no competition with Him. Whatever power I have to compete, it is also coming from Him. And that's why when Prahlad says to Narasimha, when Narasimha, so Prahlad says to Hiranyakashipu, Hiranyakashipu, where is your power coming from? Now, Prahlad is not just being cheeky over there. When he says, the source of your power, the source of my power, is the same as the source of your power, is the same as the source of the source of your power. Says, your power has come from Brahma, but Brahma's power is coming from Vishnu. So, he is not just being cheeky over there, trying to provoke his father. He's not provoking, he's educating. He says, educating. Don't see Vishnu as your competitor. There's no competition at all. 
it's a Krishna, if you know, there's a scale of excellence. Uh, Krishna, you may have from 1 to 10. Now, Krishna exists outside the scale of excellence, all scales. Now, he exists outside of all scales and wherever anyone falls on the scale of excellence, they all get their power from Krishna. So, when we understand that this Krishna is, is the source of everything attractive, then we feel inspired to devote ourselves to him. And then in the 11th, now it's interesting that after Krishna hears, uh, Krishna speaks the Chatur Shloki, more or less the Bhagavad Gita is over. Because Arjuna accepts Krishna's supreme position. He says, Param Brahma, Param Dhamma, Pavitram Paramam Bhavan. He says, You are the supreme truth. And I accept it fully. But afterwards, from the 10th chapter, almost all the questions that Arjuna is asking is for Lokahit, is to help others understand. Now, Arjun has a personal relationship with Krishna. So, for him to remember Krishna is easy. But when he is asking, how can we understand him in, uh, see him or remember him in the worldly, worldly manifestations? That is, for people who are in worldly consciousness. And similarly, in the 11th chapter, first only he says that, actually, by your message, Moho yam vigato mama, by what you have spoken, my moha is gone, my illusion is gone. It's interesting, Arjun will say the same thing in the, in the, in the 80th chapter. Nashto moha, nashto moha, Vi, moho yam vigato mama. So what is going to say at the end of the 18th chapter, he has already said over here. But then, after that, every question that he is asking is for to educate people, to help others understand Krishna's glory. And then he says, Arjun, oh Krishna, is it possible for you? To show what you have spoken in words, can you demonstrate? You said that you are the source of everything. Everything is present within you. So, says, Can you please display your form? Magnificent form which contains everything. And then Krishna says, Yes, why not? I will do this. And Krishna says, I will display something which you have, which nobody has seen before. Also. So, as Krishna says, I will not only fulfill your expectation, I will exceed your expectation. E plus, as they say <laughs> in management terminology. You know? So, then the, in this 11th chapter, so the 9th, the 10th chapters are actually very emotionally dramatic. Hmm? But the 11th chapter is very dramatic in terms of action. So what happens? Uh, there is a special narrative structure that is used here. So for, see, if, if we see something very special, something which we have never seen, we need to be oriented. What are you going to see first? If we are going to see some exhibition of some art or some something very special, which we have never, which we don't, which no, nobody has seen or very few people have seen, then we need to be explained first what you are going to see. Now, we don't just see with our eyes, we see with our intelligence. Because, that, because when we say, I see, in the conversation, I see, that means I understand, I get your point. So, we don't see just with our eyes, we see with our intelligence. And sometimes, what we see may not make sense unless it is explained with the intelligence. So, because this Vishwarupa is so astonishing a sight, so there is a triple explanation there. First, before revealing, Krishna gives an explanation, what you are going to see. So from verses 5 to, 10, uh, 5 to 10 roughly, Krishna tells Arjun, he gives a, like a sneak preview, what are you going to see? He explains first. And then when he reveals, at that time, Dhritarashtra tells Sanjay, what Krishna, is, what Krishna has shown. And then, after that, from the 15th verse, there is Arjuna's self-description. This is what I am seeing. So, the same thing is described in different perspectives. It's like, you have a camera. So, first, before you are showing, something is shown. Then you have a big picture. And Arjuna has a close-up picture. So, when Arjuna sees this, first he says, Pashyami Vishveshwara Vishwarupa. So, I understand, I am seeing this Vishwarupa. This majestic universal form I am seeing. And he's delighted on seeing this. He's thrilled. 
And as he keeps observing, he says, Dantam na madhyam na punastavadim. You are pervading all of space. There's not, there's no beginning, no middle, no end. It's magnificent. Durniriksham samantar. I can't see you very clearly. Such effulgence coming from you. But then, as he's seeing, initially, there's amazement and thrill. But slowly, pravetitam mano me. His heart starts becoming a little fearful. What happens? That he doesn't just see this magnificent form, which you see, the universe broadly has two aspects to it. There is space and there is time. So earlier, whenever Krishna has shown the Vishwarupa, he has shown the form which is pervading across space. But here, he shows not just the form pervading across space, he also shows Adrushta Purvam Rishitotsmi Dushtva Adrushta Purvam. Something which he has never seen before, and that is the Kala Rupa. And this Kala Rupa, Kala is time. And time can create, time can maintain, time can destroy. This is a battlefield where time is going to destroy. So Arjun starts saying, there is fierce form, it's, it's in the mood of devouring everything. There is a blazing fire coming from the mouth, and everything is getting destroyed. The, all living beings seem to be entering into it. What is going on? Now suppose we we go to watch a roman romantic movie, some nice rom-com, and then we go there and suddenly it turns into a horror movie. <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> and then so he's seeing this destructive form, and then you're watching that movie, and then you see in the movie that horror, horrible destruction is happening. That destruction is not just of some building somewhere, it is a theatre in which you are sitting, that is getting destroyed. <laughs> hey, what is this? <laughs> so, so, first Arjun sees this Vishwarupa devouring and this is, who are they devouring? It's all the warriors here itself. <laughs> what is going on? And, as he keeps seeing it, everybody is just charging into the mouth. It's going, going in and in and in into the mouth and he is horrified. And then there are two beautiful metaphors over there. One is patanga, just as a just as these moths enter into fire. So the Acharya explained that is like people like Duryodhana. They, by their attraction to wrongdoing, they are entering into fire. So like that, some living beings are entered uh, into the fire. Yathanadinam bahuam bhuvega. Another example is just as river enters into the ocean. And this is the example for people like Bhishma. The river naturally enters into the ocean. Now one of the commentators in the Sri Sampradaya Vedanta Deshika gives a beautiful explanation of this. And he says that actually you may say whether you are a materialist or you are a spiritualist, everybody is going to die. So what is the use of being a spiritualist? So he says that's like the difference is between a moth when it enters into a fire, its very existence is going to terminate. So similarly, materialists when they die, of course the soul is not going to die, but everything that they value in their life is going to be destroyed. So their whole concept of existence is itself going to be shattered. But when a river enters into an ocean, the water still stays the same. So a devotee is serving Krishna in this world and a devotee serves Krishna in the next world. So although the death happens, but for a devotee there is no essential, there is no drastic or traumatic transition. The devotee continues doing what he is doing in this world and in the next world. And another thing he says is, when a moth moves towards fire, the moth doesn't do anything any good to anyone. Isn't it? The moth simply dies. But when the river moves towards the ocean, the river irrigates all the land along the way. He says, similarly, a devotee is also going to die. But a devotee along their life journey, the devotees, they benefit all living beings who interact with them. So in that sense, a life devoted to Krishna is also going to end. But a life devoted to Krishna is going to benefit others and ultimately benefit and liberate that person also. So as this whole thing is entering, everything is entering into Arjuna, into the mouth of Vishwarupa and Arjuna becomes fearful, what's going on? And then he asks the question, Akya Himeko Bhavanu Grarupo. My dear Lord, who are you? Now this is quite quite again dramatic. You know, in, in, in English, any second person is referred to as he. Hmm? 
or uh, you sorry uh, but in hindi or sanskrit there is more respectful tu or aap so if somebody calls us kaun hai tu it's your boss oh namaste namaste aap aap kaise ho aap sir <laughs> so we might change so arjun even when he surrenders to krishna he says that pruchami tvam dharma sammud cheta so tvam is like tu but here when he sees this kal roopa akhya hime ko bhavan ugra roopo bhavan aap he becomes reverential what is this so <laughs> then understand and he says akhya who are you and when he says who are you what does it mean and now sometimes when we see the picture of vishwarupa here is the different vishwarupa picture but vishwarupa picture you see normally we see krishna is here then krishna is showing his fingers like this and then we see the vishwarupa so normally when we are shown it's like we see krishna arjun on the chariot and the vishwarupa but when arjun saw arjun no longer saw krishna krishna actually disappeared from his all vision and all he saw was vishwarupa and then now he has earlier identified that this is the kala roopa sorry this is vishwarupa uh, he says pashami vishveshwar vishwarupa then why is he asking who are you it's like because what has happened here he is seeing a feature is never seen before it like say we are walking along uh, uh, with a friend maybe after a program and suddenly a group of thugs attack and then we are scared and suddenly that friend starts tak 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 makes a dozen karate kicks and everybody is knocked down and then yeah who are you <laughs> <laughs> so like that arjun asking who are you <laughs> i know you as my friend i know you as my as the vishwarupa but when 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 we see something unknown about someone known then we ask who are you you know what have you done to my friend where is he gone <laughs> so similarly arjun is asking who are you he says what is what is what is this destructive manifestation and that's why when Arj, krishna when arjun asks this question and krishna answers arjun asks in 11.31 krishna answers in 11.32 so krishna doesn't say i am krishna and krishna doesn't even say i am vishwarupa what does he say i am kala roopa kalosmi lokakshay krut pravruddho lokan samahartan ih pravrutta rite pi tvam na bhavishyanti sarve ya vistita that all those who are in this particular war field i am time now time does all various things but at that particular battlefield time is going to destroy and therefore it is time i am the destroyer of all the worlds and then everybody except you rute pitwam na bhavishyanti sarve that except for you everyone is going to be destroyed and the whole idea is rute pitwam now rute can mean except for you or even without you so even without you means that arjun even if you don't fight still they are going to be destroyed they have done misdeeds and they have to get the reactions for that and if you take the secondary meaning that rute pi that without you also they will be destroyed that means arjun if you think if you don't fight this destruction will not happen it's not like that this destruction is going to happen and they, then we can see the next verse the next verse is what tasmat tamuttishtha yasho labhasva जित्वा शत्रुन भविष्यराज्य समृद्ध मयि वैते निहता पूर्वमेव निमित्त मात्रम भवसव यसाची देयरफॉर अराइज एंड फाइट अटेन विक्ट्री बाय माय अरेंजमेंट योर एनिमीज आर ऑलरेडी किल्ड जस्ट बिकम एन इंस्ट्रूमेंट इन माय फाइट जस्ट बिकम एन इंस्ट्रूमेंट इन द फाइट सो हियर दिस दिस इज अ वर्स व्हिच इज एवरी ऑफ कोर्स एवरी वर्ड ऑफ द भगवत गीता इज पैक्ड विद मीनिंग but this is very powerful verse therefore arise and fight now there is this idea that many people say that oh the world is such a terrible place that we say the bhagavata says god descends to this world to uh, to restore order in the world so why is god not descending now so why is god not descending and fixing things so the bhagavad gita tells us that god doesn't descend to fix things in the world 
God descends to fix us so that we can fix things in the world. <laughs> so, Krishna is not telling Arjuna, I'll kill all of them. Krishna is saying, you kill all of them. So, Arjuna is bewildered. Arjuna doesn't know what to do. He's confused. So, Krishna speaks the Bhagavad Gita. Krishna fixes Arjuna. After Krishna fixes Arjuna, then Arjuna will fix the things. So, the whole idea is, devotion is not about giving up responsibility. Oh, God will do everything. No. Yes, it is I who should do things in the service of God. It is we who have to take responsibility for the service of God. And therefore, uh, Krishna is saying, therefore you arise and fight. Ah, but there are so many obstacles. You know, actually speaking, no matter how bad things are, we can make them worse. <laughs> 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 you know, you can think anything in your life, no matter how bad is it, can you make it worse? <laughs> Obviously you can, isn't it? Say, I might fracture my hand and it's terrible. But you know, my fractured cast, I can smash it on the ground again. I can make it worse. So the point why I'm making this is that if we can make things worse, that means we always have free will. And that means we can make things better also. It's a very important point. Sometimes you feel, I am helpless. My situation is so terrible, I can't do anything. Well, can you make things worse? Yeah, I can do that. <laughs> then you can make things better also. <laughs> so, Krishna is telling Arjun, take responsibility. And when we may feel, oh, but there are so many problems, how can I deal with them? Krishna, then he says, Maya ivaite nihata purva meva. By my arrangement, the obstacles will be removed. So the obstacles, the enemies are killed by my arrangement, Krishna said. But you have to fight. So sometimes we feel that the problems in my life are such that I just can't do anything. It's like mission impossible. Now in a movie, mission impossible, something sounds very attractive, okay. Because we know they are going to make it possible. But in our life, when we see something is mission impossible, I feel like I just can't do it. But what Krishna is telling, that this is going to happen. It's not mission impossible, it's mission unstoppable. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, 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 they're all destroyed. So that's why when Prabhupada went to America, it's um, all alone with just 70 rupees, with just few 40 rupees at the age of 70, it was mission impossible. But, Prabhupada is not thinking I am the doer. Prabhupada is saying Krishna is the doer. And therefore, even when Prabhupada had no facility, no support, but Prabhupada says, yes, there are temples. It's just time is separating us from them. So Prabhupada saw it not as mission impossible, he saw it as mission unstoppable. This is going to happen. The same applies to our inner struggles also. We may have many, many conditionings. And how can I overcome them? I can't. No, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. We can only decide how fast or how slowly it will happen. Now, it can happen in one lifetime or it can take 100,000 lifetimes. But we will become purified. Prabhupada would say that Krishna consciousness is like a fatal disease. <laughs> if you become Krishna conscious, your material existence is going to end. You will get liberated. But, this is, if we disease, the more we get infected, the happier we become. It's not a disease that hurts us, it actually makes us happy. So, we, we should never lose heart. And Arjuna says, Nimitta ma Krishna does Arjuna, Nimitta matram bhava Just become an instrument in the fight. So, we just do what we can. And Krishna will do what we can't. If we just do what we can, Krishna will do what we can't. But unfortunately, what we do, we keep looking at all that we can't do. And then we stop doing what we can also. So, instead of doing like that, just do what we can. And Krishna will do what we can't. So this is a very reassuring, very inspiring, action, action, action invoking words of the Bhagavad Gita. Now, after that, when Krishna completes this, gives a call of action, then Arjuna starts offering prayers again. And when he offers prayers, 
so you are the vishwarupa i want to offer obeisances to you but suppose we come to a temple and then temple if you see all four directions there are deities how do i offer obeisances then is it it so he says krishna you are the vishwarupa all vishwa is your rupa so where do i offer obeisances so therefore he says i offer obeisances from the front i offer from the obeisances from the back i offer obeisances from the right i offer obeisances from the left okay i offer obeisances hundreds of times so he said nama purastal ta prishta taste namo stute i offer you again and again obeisances and then he starts thinking actually i took krishna for granted saketi matva yat prasabam so i thought of you as friend and i taunted you oh you are very clever and i thought that actually you know you are only a member of the royal family you know you are is your grandfather the king and you are just ordinary people i am a member of the same generation my brother is the king i am a part of the royal family i thought i was superior to you but i was so foolish and he says whatever stupidity i have committed please forgive me chamaswatam please forgive me and then then arjun says okay krishna now this this darshan is enough now now <laughs> he is speaking all this what is it? says please show me your saumya roopa please show me your gentle form now hmm? now krishna krishna accepts arjuna's prayer and krishna just teases arjuna in the arjun actually this darshan is extremely rare you know even by the study of the vedas by the performance of great austerity you cannot get this even the devatas desire to see this but arjun says i have seen enough now <laughs> <laughs> So, are you saying that I don't want to see it? Then Krishna says, "Okay, okay. Maate yatha maache vimud bhavo. Please do not be agitated. Become peaceful. Now I will show you my saumya roopa." And Acharya explained that Krishna showed first his vishva roopa, then he shows his chatur bhuja roopa, and then he shows his dvi bhuja roopa. And he comes back, and then Arjun says, "Now I have become peaceful." peaceful is bhayena cha pravetitam mano me is mind it become fearful but then it became peaceful and then it's very striking this same bhagavad gita 11.33 is oh they are enemies and they have been they are going to be killed by my arrangement but the bhagavad gita 11.55 this 11th chapter concludes with a declaration that mat karma krun mat paramo mat bhakta sang varjitah निर्वैर सर्वूतेषु यमेति पांडव कृष्ण सेज दैट ओके यू वर्क फॉर मी एंड वर्क विदाउट एनी एनिमोसिटी टुवर्ड्स एनी वन निर्वैर सर्वूतेषु दिस किज वॉट्स गोइंग ऑन यर जस्ट नाउ कृष्ण सेड दैट ऑल दोज कौरवाज आर गोइंग टू द विराट विश्व रूप एंड गोइंग टू डिगो आउट एंड कृष्ण सेड आई हैव रिमूव द एनिमीज फ्रॉम युअर पाथ fight and he also mentions them you know that bishma drona they're all going to die in fact he also says over there that jayadrath is also entering into the mouth now jayadrath is not a very prominent warrior and jayadrath is not seen in the first is not mentioned by duryodhan also in the first chapter but krishna knows that duryodhan jayadrath is going to create a special problem and krishna is assured you know jayadrath will be eliminated so he mentions all these enemies and he says nirvairah sarvabhuteshu don't fight with animosity to don't don't have animosity towards anyone so what's going on just now he said enemies and now he said no animosity so the point is there can a devotee may have sometimes have to fight against someone but a devotee is never against anyone they two different things we may have to fight against someone because they are fighting against krishna they are fighting against dharma so we may have to fight against them but we are never against anyone a devotee is the well wisher of everyone this is krishna is the well wisher devotee is also the well wisher when prabhupada wanted to build a temple in juhu there was a the the person who sold the land was like a very scheming manipulative person and he took the money and he did not give the land papers also and he started to get gundas and hooligans and attack the devotees threaten the devotees and then eventually when he died his wife took it up and she tried to get some hooligans to to just destroy the temple structure itself but everything turned against and when the temple was destroyed devotees became 
people people in India came out in support, and then she realized that you know this is not going to work. So then she came to Prabhupada for a reconciliation, and when she came and offered her respects to Prabhupada, Prabhupada just said, "Don't worry, you're just like my daughter." And Prabhupada was very affectionate to her. Before that, if you see the kind of letters Prabhupada writing disciples, no, nobody was going to steal this temple from Krishna, even over my dead body. I will make sure that it will not happen. So a devotee may fight. A, a devotee may fight against someone, but a devotee is never against anyone. Sometimes for our service, we may have to do something just confrontational. So Krishna is telling. So at one level, the immediate Bhagavad Gita battlefield context is it's going to be a fierce war. But the bigger picture is Krishna is not telling Arjuna to fight a war. Krishna is telling Arjuna to practice bhakti. in his emergency situation he has to practice bhakti by fighting a war similarly for us when we have to do anything in this world we have to struggle the struggle for practicing bhakti we have to fight against our inner enemies outside there are so many obstacles so we have to fight so when we have to fight that means i gave a class in america that the way to vrindavan is through kurukshetra <laughs> you have to fight in this world and sometimes you may appear as if you have to fight with devotees also because we want to do some service and nobody seems to be cooperating you know one devotee disciple wrote a letter to prabhupada saying that you know, actually all my god brothers all my god sisters they are discouraging me so much and i am feeling so discouraged and prabhupada said there is nothing new i also got nothing except depression compression and repression from my god brothers <laughs> but prabhupa said we do not function on this platform of getting discouraged because we function for the service of krishna so it's not that devotees are bad it's just that we are living in a material world and all of us have some quota of adibhuti klesh to suffer we have some quota of suffering which has to come from other living beings now if most of the other living beings around us are devotees then that quota has to come through devotees <laughs> So, <laughs> so sometimes for our service, we may seem to have to fight against devotees also. But we, even if we have to fight for that, like Prabhu Pa sometimes spoke very strong words against his god brothers. You know, one particular god brother who had tried to steal away some of Prabhu Pa's disciples and you know say that actually I can give you more knowledge. Prabhu Pa said that he is like an envious snake. Don't go near him. And then when he passed away, now devotees like to hear where did he go. Which hell did he go to? You would, you would like to ask him when somebody dies. Where did he go? And Prabhu Pad said he went back to the spiritual world. He served my spiritual master. My spiritual master is very powerful. So when it was for the protection of his disciples, Prabhu Pad was fighting against even his god brothers. But Prabhu Pad was not against his god brothers. He respected them. He respected their service to Krishna. And he saw he saw saw their service to spiritual master and to Krishna. So the point is. we may have to fight against someone but we don't have to be against anyone and that is the mood of the bhagavad gita also when it says nirvairah sarvabhuteshu so then after that it comes to the 12th chapter so i don't think we are going to complete 18 chapters <laughs> actually we are going to have a, a session on tuesday which is going to be a question answer session so maybe we could uh, continue that this on tuesday or i can maybe in Five five minutes. Try to rush the five five minutes. Rush through the all chapters. What should I do? Tuesday. Tuesday. Okay. Monday or Tuesday? Tuesday. Sorry. No, I thought that tomorrow is this. Kirtan is there, so it might, it might be difficult to come on Monday. Monday is the public holiday. Okay, fine. So, we'll so okay. So okay. <laughs> okay. So Monday, Monday we will continue this. So I just. Uh, how many of you have questions right now? Okay. So you don't have time to think about questions. Also. <laughs> okay. So I'll speak twelve chapter, and then if there are any questions, we can take a few questions. So now, now after this whole action gets over, uh, the whole converse, this whole dramatic thing has happened. 
and after that it's like the whole conversation goes on as if nothing has happened you know, it's, it's, it's this very dramatic thing has happened and after that it's a very serious philosophical discussion so sometimes if you try to look for the thread of connection between arjuna's questions it might seem very difficult uh, it's like say suppose you know suddenly uh, if you if you are sitting all hearing his class and suddenly we hear there's a bomb scare and then suddenly some very fierce looking terrorists come over here and everybody gets alarmed and then those terrorists go away and everybody sits down and continues the class hey you know what happened nobody is disturbed but what has happened is that arjun for him it's just his conviction is reinforced and then the next question that he asks is krishna there are different manifestations some people worship you in the personal manifestation some in the impersonal so which is better now what is the correlation between 11th and 12th chapters there are multiple correlations one is actually based on 9.15 9.15 krishna uh, 9.11 12 krishna talks about his pure devotee uh, or talks people who are like demoniac 13 14 he talks about his pure devotees at 15 he gives people between at the two levels those who worship the devatas those who worship the vishwarupa and those who worship the impersonal manifestation ekatvena prutakvena bahuda vishvatomukam so prutakvena bahuda he has talked about in from 9.20 to 9.34 yesterday i talked about how krishna compares the worship of the devatas with the worship of krishna and then the vishvatomukam the vishwarup and its how that comes from krishna is talked about in the 11th chapter and then ekatvena those who are those who think everything is one what about them krishna asks uh, krishna is asked by arjun so it's 9.15 it is three people who are in between not demonic not divine not where what is their status and krishna answers very clearly that those who fix their mind on me manya vaishyamano ye ma itte yukta upasate shandhya paryo petaste me yukta tamo mata they are the most intimately united with me those are devoted to my personal form but then after that he says that those who worship the impersonal they will also come to me te prapnuvanti mameva they will also come to me but it is a very difficult path klesho diktaraste sham it's filled with klesha it's quite difficult so the point here is this is krishna when he is talking about it is people who are attracted to the impersonal aspect they are not offensive they are brahmavadis like krishna talks 9.11 and 12 avajananti mam mudha he is talking about mayavadis now what is a mayavadi a brahmavadi is someone who is attracted to the impersonal manifestation a mayavadi is somebody who thinks that the personal manifestation is an illusion and you have to go beyond the personal manifestation to the impersonal manifestation so they think that actually krishna's all attractive form is maya so that is offensive and that's why mayavadis are spoken about in strongly negative terms but at the same time most people who say that oh everything is one i want to enter into that oneness uh, and now most of them are actually not mayavadis so in general on the spiritual path the default philosophical position of people will be impersonalism that's a default philosophical position why because we are attracted to all the forms of this world and the attraction to the forms of this world captivates us and deludes us so if you don't want to be attracted then you have to go beyond the forms so by default people will go from the form to the formless and then they can come from the formless to the spiritual form so when somebody says everything is one if you say oh you are mayavadi actually to call people who say everything is one as a mayavadi is to give them too much credit <laughs> is to give them too much credit mayavadi is a philosophy it's in its own way it's a, it's a complex philosophy and people have a lot of complicated ideas about mayavadi most people who say everything is one they just have heard it somewhere and they maybe read something about it and everything is one yeah everything is one so krishna is not very critical about this he says that's also a path but it's gradual it's very difficult to grow by that path and then again he contrasts yesterday also i said about the bhagavad gita is a book of not of commandments but of choices and consequences so to so make this choice it's a very slow difficult process 
But the other path, he says that if you take, if you become devoted to me, Tesha maham samudharta, Rutyu samsara sagarat, Bhavamina chirat partha, Maya veshita chetasam. He says that you just devote yourself to me and you will come to me. You will come to me, Krishna says. How will you come to me? I will lift you out. Aham samudharta. I will become like your deliverer and quickly, nachi chira, very quickly I will deliver you. So Krishna is giving us assurance of his personal intervention if you choose the path of devotion. And then somebody says, I say, actually, you know, fixing the mind of Krishna is quite difficult. My mind wanders all over the world. So Krishna, then he says, it's like a ladder. If you come up here, I'll lift you out. It's like, say, somebody is saying that, okay, I'm up there and you are in the ocean. I, you just raise your hand up and I'll pick you up. This person says, you know, actually, I can't raise my hand. Okay, Krishna says, you can't raise my hand, you just keep swimming. You know, I will pick you up. So Krishna says, you can't fix your mind on me. Actually, just try to fix your mind on me. So just do sadhana bhakti. By that you will come, by that you will be attracted to me. Actually, I can't even, so you can't be absorbed in Krishna while chanting. Okay, just try to chant and try to absorb yourself. Like if, if we can't do spontaneous devotion, we can do conscientious devotion. It is said that when the Lord Darshan happens, at that time, ah, Hare Krishna. Battery? Okay. So, am I audible? Okay. So, when the Lord Darshan opens, the pure devotees are so ecstatic on beholding the Lord that they faint and fall down. Now for us it is said, you don't faint but at least fall down. <laughs> so, if we can't do spontaneous devotion, at least do conscientious devotion. <laughs> so, the Krishna says, okay, if you can't do this, do this. Somebody says, I can't do this also. And the Krishna says, okay, if you can't do this, at least work for me. Some people say, okay, I'll come to the temple but don't tell me to do japa. Okay. Okay, then at least come to the temple and do some seva. There's one devotee in LA, he was doing a program in UCLA for the students over there. And every day he would do the, uh, every week he would do the program, many students would come. And he would invite them, come to the temple, we have a nice talk over there and we have, we have Kirtan Arthi, nobody would come. And then he told them one day, that actually we have a Sunday program in which we serve free food to 300 people. Would you, like, can, would you like to come and serve food, free food to 300 people? He says, yeah, you would like to come. And almost 95% people came. So, they are not ready to hear about Krishna. But do some seva, they can do the seva. So, we can, we can connect people at whatever level they are ready to connect. And if somebody says, oh, I cannot do seva also. Okay, then Krishna says, at least become selfless. So, don't just keep all your things for yourself. Give it to somebody else. Just expand yourself in selflessness. So what is Krishna doing? It's like Krishna is offering a descending ladder of love. If you can't do this, it's not that I'm rejecting you. You can't do this, do this. If you can't do this, do this. If you can't do this, do this. So in that sense, Krishna is a very accommodating God. In the biblical tradition, there is the idea that God is a jealous God. That if you don't worship, you should not worship any other gods apart from me. Don't bow down to any other gods. But Krishna, he says, if you don't worship me, that, that the idea in the Bible is that if you don't, if you don't worship the one true God, then you will go to hell. And there are some extremist people. The religions they say you are not only going to go to hell, we will send you there faster. <laughs> <laughs> so Krishna is not like that. What Krishna says is, okay, if you can't do this, do this. If you can't do this, do this. So Krishna is not a jealous God. He is a zealous God. He is zealously working to provide us facilities to rise up, to connect with him, to come to him. And then, so this is described different levels from 12.8 to 12. And then in 12.13 12 12 to 20, he talks about different qualities. That these are different... Now, at one level, 
if somebody is devoted they attract they attract krishna but krishna says that we don't see devotion as separate from other virtues a devotee should also have other virtues and krishna talks about how a devotee is equi- is kind to everyone adveshta sarvabhutanam maitra karuna evacha is not possessive is humble is gentle is sense controlled eh, eh, so in this way what krishna is saying that if if somebody is devoted they are dear to me but if somebody is devoted and has virtues then they they are dear to me so as devotees we also need to develop virtues because what happens we often may think that okay uh, may, what is my bhakti my bhakti is that i do my sadhana i have my philosophy sad we have three things we have siddhanta we have sadhana and we have seva now these three are very important that our how much philosophy we know properly how much uh, sadhana we are doing how we are chanting our rounds how we are worshiping the deities and okay what all seva we do from the bhakti perspective these are what is important but from the world's perspective uh, who cares how many verses from the bhagavad gita you know who cares how much philosophy you know who cares how much sadhana what time you wake up who cares how many rounds you chant the only thing that the world is going to see is sadachar is behavior so all these qualities which krishna is talking is, uh, about talking is about sadachar the world will see our sadachar and that's why mr prabhupada was asked that uh, that how do we know your disciples prabhupada said they are perfect gentlemen a perfect gentleman perfect ladies and perfect gentlemen because people will not appreciate oh we chant 16 rounds every day okay fine so what they not going to care about that so like earlier i said krishna is attract we have to present krishna's greatness in people's terms of greatness mm-hmm. so similarly like in india you may have known that this is this giant bhagavad gita the world's biggest religious text was inaugurated by the prime minister modi and you know the bhagavad gita has always been there in the temple but the newspaper reporters didn't come to see the bhagavad gita but when this giant bhagavad gita was there they came and all the tv channels they started displaying that so what is attractive to people is not bhagavad gita it is the size of the bhagavad gita <laughs> <laughs> now actually what is really attractive is the bhagavad gita isn't it <laughs> but we have to present the attractiveness in people's terms of attractiveness so similarly now now a devotee is devoted to krishna that's wonderful but people would appreciate that so we have to present it in a way that people can understand so prabhupada would go for morning walks in the west the morning walks he would not greet people as hari krishna he would greet people good morning because you know, as gentlemen in hari krishna what will they understand now of course hari krishna is well known in the world also but the point is that krishna is talking about sadachar over here because he talks about qualities which even ordinary people can appreciate devotion ordinary people may not appreciate but virtues people can appreciate and if somebody is a virtuous devotee then people will be attracted to that virtuous devotee they may not be attracted to the devotion they will be attracted to the virtues and from those virtues oh you are so virtuous and you are a devotee also oh i should also practice bhakti so krishna says therefore those who are devoted to me they are very dear to me those who are devoted with virtues that bhakti man me priyo naraha such devotees are very dear to me now we may say oh but i don't have virtues what to do i say don't worry we just have devotion that itself makes me you dear to me ye tu dharma amrita vidam athoktam paripasate shraddha dhana mat parama bhaktaste teva me priya that is somebody is devoted to me then that itself makes them extremely dear to me because from that devotion purification will happen pure by purification other virtues will come so in this way here krishna completes his bhakti section by emphatically glorifying devotion first he glorifies his own first uh, broadly five ways in which he glorifies devotion first is by comparing with ashtang yoga in the eighth chapter where he says that actually first is by talking about the power of illusion and how bhakti can free us from illusion ma me ye prapadanti maya me tantra the second is eighth chapter he says okay ashtang yoga is good that can also liberate you but tasya ham sulabha partha is much much easier by the practice of bhakti in the ninth chapter he contrasts bhakti with 
the other process of worship of devutas. He says bhakti is so wonderful, the best process. Tenth chapter, he actually says that bhakti is something which you can do even in this world, by connecting the things of this world. So you don't have to renounce the world. Just connect the world with Krishna. And then what is the greatest in this world? All that comes from Krishna is contained by Krishna. That's all shown in the Vishwarupa chapter. And then twelfth chapter is the comparison of the impersonal and the impersonal. Impersonal and the person, Krishna says that the devotee is far superior. So in this way, in a completely unambiguous, emphatic way, Krishna proclaims the glory of devotion and inspires us all to take shelter of Bhakti Devi, of Srimati Radharani. And that's how the Bhakti section completes by declaring anyone who is a devotee is extremely dear to me. So I'll summarize what I spoke today. So I covered three chapters today broadly. Uh, so 10th, 11th, 12th. And in the 10th chapter I talk elaborately about Vibhuti Yoga that Krishna says he speaks his glories so that he can glorify devotion and thereby inspire us to practice devotion. Krishna is not on an ego trip. Krishna is actually speaking his glories like is to persuade us to fix a mind on him like a doctor telling all other doctors are trained by me only. And so Krishna tells Arjun that everything attractive comes from him. So we don't have to reject what we are attracted to. We connect what we are attracted to to him. And the vibhuti is not like absolute oneness. Krishna and Arjuna are not one. Krishna chooses Arjuna, Arjuna say to say, I am on Pandava, I am Arjuna. But that doesn't mean they are one. What it means is the one above the many manifests as the one among the many. We can't see the one above the many. But we see the one among the many. Most attractive. And there, from there we can direct our thoughts towards Krishna. And God is not just the best of all beings. He is the basis of all being. So God's glory should not uh, trigger any competitive mentality within us. Rather, submissive. everything good within me also comes from Him. And the whole Chatur Shloki Bhagavad Gita is for the purpose of stressing in two verses Krishna's merciful intervention in the life of His devotee. You devote yourself to me, even if you have deficiency in knowledge, anything, doesn't matter. I will give the intelligence by which you can come to me. And then he says that, uh, then from Arjun's illusion is removed over there. He accepted Krishna as supreme. But all the subsequent questions are for the purpose of actually lokahita, for illuminating people. So first question is, how can we see you in this world? And the question is, can you demonstrate your Vishwarupa? And we talk Vishwarupa about how Krishna also shows the Kala Rupa. And Arjuna gets scared. It's like you're watching a romantic movie and it turns out to be a horror movie. And the horror is happening in your own house. What's going on? Right? So Twam becomes Bhavan. And Krishna tells Arjuna that I am time and except for you or even in spite of you. Everybody is going to be destroyed. So then Krishna doesn't descend to the world to fix the world. Krishna descends to the world to fix us so that we can fix the world. So for us what may seem as mission impossible can actually become mission unstoppable by Krishna's grace. And then after that in the 11th chapter, he tells Arjuna that you just become an instrument. So for us also, uh, you know, even if no matter how terrible things are, we can make them worse, so we can make them better also. We have free will. And if we do what we can, Krishna will do what we can't. And then the, the whole 11th chapter concludes by Nirvairaha Sarvabhuteshu. A devotee may fight against someone, but a devotee is not against anyone. We fight because we want to serve Krishna and protect Krishna's service, but we don't have any animosity towards anyone. The way to Kur Vindavan is through Kurukshetra. Inside, outside, we have to fight for serving Krishna in this world. And then, then we came to the 12th chapter. So the questions are based on 9.15. The 10th, 11th, 12th chapter questions are there. 
so uh, the 12th chapter question is actually how how do we know which which is better superior in, in personal or personal and there i talked about how personal is best krishna says but in personal people also come to me so today most people who have impersonal conceptions they are not mayavadi they are just brahmavadi is a default philosophical conception of people on the spiritual path so krishna says i will deliver those who uh, become devoted to me and then he offers a descending ladder of virtue that if you can't fix your mind spontaneously fix it consciously conscientiously if you can't do that you just serve me if it work for me serve me if you can't do that just work for some good cause and become selfless so krishna is not a jealous god he is a selfless god and then lastly krishna says that it's not just devotion but devotion with virtue that endears us to him in the world's eyes if if the path of bhakti is to be attractive people will not directly see bhakti alone they will see the virtues of the bhaktas and so we prabhupad said followers are like perfect gentlemen and ladies and if somebody says oh virtues are not possible still practice bhakti just practicing bhakti will also endear us to krishna so in different ways krishna emphatically glorifies devotion and inspires us all to wholeheartedly embrace the path of devotion thank you very much hare krishna hare krishna so any questions quickly yes please yeah okay are there any brahmavadis in the world today where do they live what is their sadhana <laughs> how do they walk <laughs> see generally it is very difficult to know people's conception externally even if somebody is externally belonging to organization that is we could say mayavadi but is it necessary that all the people in that organization will also be having mayavad as i said brahmavad means people are just attracted to the impersonal manifestation they have their idea of oneness and they want to go into the oneness and they have not been explained the personal aspect in philosophical terms so they they have no attraction to it either they have not met devotees or they have not met learned devotees uh, who can explain philosophical terms so that's why that bhakti towards the personal aspect has not come so in my understanding most people whom we deal with it is safe to most people who are spiritualists and who talk about oneness it is safe to start with the idea that they are brahmavadis no need to presume that they are mayavadis so there there are of course some people who are who are offensive to the lord also but most of their followers they are not philosophical so we could say that there are mayavadis and people under mayavad influence and people under mayavad influence are usually not mayavadis they are just brahmavadis they have the idea of oneness that's all so see for most people when they come to a spiritual path philosophy is not what brings them to the spiritual path it is a culture it is a sense of community it is a sense of continuity with tradition it is a sense of belonging it is a sense of peace of mind there are so many things other things actually which bring people to people to a spiritual organization a spiritual movement to make a choose a spiritual path so even if people are following a particular spiritual path which we could from a, which say is mayavadi their philosophy is not the major reason why they are following it so for them to come to krishna also even if they have some philosophical conceptions i am talking from a practical experiential experiential perspective philosophy is very rarely an obstacle for people to come to krishna but there are some but it's very rare so even if their philosophy is wrong wrong philosophy is not as much as an obstacle as our telling them that their philosophy is wrong <laughs> so what happens is you tell them this is wrong oh but you know such a such a famous teacher says this and you say that is wrong how can you say they are wrong so best is for most people we can present philosophy in a non confrontational way just present the personal philosophy and people see most indians if you can say you're talking mostly about indians most indians are more interested in worship than the object of worship 
that means many people will come to the temple and pray with such folded hands closed eyes moving their head with such sincerity feel even i don't pray like this to krishna and while going back you will ask who is there on the altar <laughs> <laughs> so the point is that it's like somebody who is out in the cold and they have got a torn tattered piece of cloth and now we want to give them a, a very thick a soft comforter which will protect them from the cold much better but if we tell them you know just put aside that cloth and we try to pull that cloth away from them they will hold on to that cloth as if it's their life because that is the only thing protecting them from cold right now so instead of trying to pull away that cloth just put the comfort on them and once they start experiencing the comfort oh, hey this is so good and they will themselves think actually that torn tattered sheet i don't need it just put it aside so what i what is this compared to is that people there is world is in rajas and tamas and the modes of passion and ignorance cause a lot of agitation to people's minds and even if people experience some sattva they might just come to a place and they just close their eyes and do some deep breathing they just recite some om or whatever they do something and they experience some peace and that's what they consider as spiritual so although that they I mean they hardly any philosophy philosophy doesn't make sense whatever but they have come there because they got the experience so it's like from the cold of rajas and tamas whatever little spirituality they have done that is like their tattered thin sheet that is giving them protection and so it may be wrong it like that it's torn it's tattered but it's giving them some experience of sattva over there when we try to pull it away so as i said when we their wrong philosophy doesn't obstruct them as much as our calling their philosophy wrong so pull give up this sheet no so just just give our philosophy to them give just give out give them an opportunity to experience krishna not just our philosophy but the whole krishna culture the krishna relationships the krishna worship and many people actually make a seamless transition so they not most people don't go to any spiritual path because of the philosophy philosophy is one aspect no doubt but it is not a very prominent aspect so even if somebody's philosophy some even if we say people are brahmavadis or mayavadis whatever just don't worry about what they are focus on connecting them with krishna when prabhupad went to america actually there was a big interest in indian spirituality and that interest in indian spirituality at that time was because of many other spiritual teachers who had gone in the past now most of them were impersonalists but people people just they were interested in indian spirituality they had some impersonal conceptions but they were open to indian spirituality so similarly even if somebody is uh, mayavadi or whatever often people that makes them at least at a practical level favorable to krishna at an ideological or philosophical level if they are at that level they may be unfavorable but most people are not at that level so we just there we can assume that most people are like at the brahmavad level and treat them accordingly and many of them will come towards bhakti okay okay yeah uh, yes please yeah for vishwarup darshan yeah okay okay as i mentioned that was for people in general you know arjuna didn't have the desire to see the vishwarupa when he had krishna's vibhuja rupa but it was because he he wanted people to know what has verbally proclaimed is also visually demonstrated and that's why afterward arjuna is not captivated by the vishwarupa he he comes back i want to see your two handed form 
So it's just contextual for reinforcing a particular point. Okay. That's all there are no other reasons given as far as I know. Thank you. So one last question anyone has? Yes, please. Okay. Okay, we'll come to you just one minute. Yeah. Okay. So, around 18.65 and 66, like commandments, Saradharma, Antaritajama, Amikam, Sharanam, Raja. See, when I say that, that the Bhagavad Gita is not a book of commandments, that doesn't, uh, it's more of choices and consequences. That doesn't mean there are no directive or instructive statements. The mood of the Bhagavad Gita is not that Krishna is a god up there demanding obedience down here. So, that naturally, there are some statements which are instructive. But even if you say the Sarvadharma Adhaja Mame Kam Sharanam Raja, it's not like a, it's, it's not so much instructive as inspiring. There is a call for action, but there's a reciprocation, there's an assurance, there's a guarantee. If you do this, I'll do this for you. So, commandments, in the sense that Krishna giving some command, commanding like statements, you may find some statements like that. The technical word Baldevi Javashan uses is, they are, just, they are uh, sentences in the imperative. Imperative means do this. No, please get get this get water for me. Or carry that bag. So that's imperative statements. So surrender to me. That's an imperative statement. But the overall mood of the Bhagavad Gita is of discussion and deliberation. It is not of domination. I I this is my way, you have to follow it. It's not like that. Okay? Thank you. Yes. Yes. Okay, good question. If somebody is uh, doing good work in the world, but they are not against God nor for, for God, they are apathetic towards God, then uh, uh, would they be called karma yogis? Uh, in, the broad, in a very broad sense of the word, we could say that they are working for some good cause. So, there is some kind of yoga, there is some kind of connection with something higher. In a more specific or technical Bhagavad Gita sense, yoga is actually a connection with the higher reality. Yoga is con connection with the spiritual reality. So, karma that connects us with spirituality, with transcendence, with ultimately God, that is karma yoga. Now, in karma yoga, the person may not know what is that higher reality. But that person understands there is some higher, higher reality and I am working for that higher purpose. So, uh, instead of trying to technically classify whether it is karma yoga or not, we can say that if somebody is working for a good cause, they are broadly in sattva, in the mode of goodness. And many times if somebody is apathetic towards God, that's often because they may have had some, they not had some positive experiences with, uh, with uh, say, with, with religion or with religious people. Sorry? Yeah, that's true. That's a good example. So basically what we would say is that uh, it depends on the person's consciousness. If somebody is broadly in Sattva Guna, working Sattva Guna, then Urdhvam Gachan Sattvastha. That will elevate them. If they are rajas or tamas, accordingly, that will that will affect them also. So it's a whole subject actually. I talk about this in terms of there are functional values and there are foundational values or fundamental values. So functional values refer to how we function in this world. And sometimes even an atheist, what to speak of an agnostic or a or a the word is up there's a whole ism called apathyism. Apathyism is I don't care about God, whether he exists or not. So whether the atheist, even somebody is an atheist, sometimes the atheist may also in functional terms be in Sattva Guna. Because they might be living like 
uh, regulated lives they might be kind they might be sensitive polite like that it's possible so functional values are largely determined by our past karma and our present up upbringing along with our present choices fundamental values are our und understanding of life's fundamental realities who am i what is life's purpose so now these two values are two separate things so i give the example that i give a whole series of uh, bhagavatam classes in chicago on bhakti in the three modes so normally we say bhakti is transcendental but the bhagavatam says bhakti can be in the three modes also so it's like somebody is driving a car and some people are terrible drivers <laughs> when they drive it's like everybody runs away from them <laughs> some people they they start driving and everybody else stops driving you know okay you go over there i'll go after <laughs> so it's like say the the kind of car we have and the way we drive the car that is like our functional values so some people drive very smoothly some people drive a little passionately some people drive terribly so so like that we can say sattva rajas tamas refers to how well we drive the car that's functional values now fundamental values is where we are driving the car so somebody may be driving the car expertly but they are going away from the destination then the expert driving is not of that much use so somebody may, so the how people live in this world is determined by the modes but why people live in this world or what what purpose they are living that depends on their overall world view so it's possible that people may have very good functional values but may not have good fundamental values so we don't deny that functionally the people can be good and if they are good that goodness is to be appreciated then depending on what is their what is their conception ultimate of a fundamental conception that will depend determine where their destination will be so functional values count and fundamental values also count so sometimes if devotees may have the fundamental value that i am i am going towards krishna but if the functional values are not very good a devotee is quarrelsome devotee is rude a devotee a religious people like that then it becomes a problem in fact if you look at the history of religion the biggest cause of atheism is the is the exploitative behavior of religious people itself of some some religious heads or whatever they were abusive or exploitative or power hungry or whatever so say wherever there is virtue we appreciate that so we could say virtue is like functional call functional functional values and bhakti is like the fundamental value so ideally is if both come together and if somebody can meet if a person who is in sattva guna like that or some is living a regulated life they can meet a bhakta they can a bhakta who can explain things properly for them then bo if the both function and fundamental values come together the person can be a such a person can be a very powerful agent of positive change in the world okay so thank you very much shri prabhupada ki gaur bhakta vrind ki tai gaur premanande Yes so Monday evening will be the uh, next class on this series of Krishna's moods in the Bhagavad Gita Hare Krishna